Welcome to the Long COVID podcast with me, Jackie Baxter. I am really excited to bring you today's episode. Please do check out the links in the show notes where you can find the podcast website, social media and support group, as well as a link to buy me a coffee if you are able. You should not rely on any medical information contained in this podcast and related materials in making medical health related or other decisions. Please do consult a doctor or other health professional. I love to hear from you. If you've got any suggestions or feedback or just want to say hey, then please do get in touch. I really hope you enjoy this episode, so here we go. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Long Covid podcast. I am delighted to be joined today by psychologist Sally Riggs, who has also been living with Long Covid. So we're going to draw on both her clinical knowledge as well as her own experiences to chat about some of the psychological impacts of a long illness such as long COVID. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Jackie. Thank you for having me on. So it's absolutely wonderful to have you here. Would you mind starting off by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit more about what you do? Yeah, so I'm a psychologist. Uh, I trained in the UK, gosh, a long time ago now, and I worked in the UK for a few years. And then I moved to America 2008. And I have been here since then. Um, My specialty is CBT for psychosis, which is voices, visions, paranoia, suspiciousness, strongly held beliefs. So really nothing to do with chronic illness, except for folks who have psychosis have all experienced gaslighting. And when I started to experience gaslighting, suddenly I had this new found empathy for my patients that this was an experience that I knew about clinically and to go through it myself was not enjoyable, but enriched my kind of ability to be a good psychologist for them. So I, you know, I don't have a background in in chronic illness. In terms of my professional background, we covered it a little bit when I was doing my training, but the stuff that we now know is nonsense, like uh, graded exercise and CBT for chronic fatigue um, and all of those silly things that uh, are not true. So I was coming into having chronic illness myself completely kind of fresh in that respect. That's really my professional background and how it sort of intersects a little bit with this awful thing that we've all been going through. <laughs> Yeah. Can we talk briefly about your experiences with COVID? Were you in America at the time when you got ill? Yeah. So I'm based here in New York City and having worked for many years in all kinds of different public and um, private health settings, I started my own private practice in 2015. So I was working in private practice here in Manhattan and uh, I had five other psychologists working for me in a group that I was running and the good old COVID panic was, you know, coming down. And it was right at that point when everyone was talking about that flatten the curve graph that was sort of going around on social media. Um, And before you guys got locked down in the UK, before we had, wasn't called lockdown here, it's the rest in place order, which started, I think, on March 20th. I actually made the executive decision to move to telemedicine the week before that, because I wanted to be part of flattening the curve and protecting my patients and my staff. So I made that decision the Wednesday night, Thursday, I saw everybody on telemedicine, Patients were very anxious, staff were very anxious, some hadn't done telemed before. And so by Friday, I was exhausted and I thought it was because of that. And now I realize that that was my first day of symptoms of acute COVID infection that I had already contracted before we moved to stay at home. So that was the beginning for me. I tried to get a test on the Monday and tests here were only available for people who had been in contact with someone who tested positive 
or who had been to China. And I had done neither. Although coincidentally, another member of my staff also thought she had it, but she and I had not seen each other. She'd been at a conference in New Orleans. So I tried to get a test, was not able to get a test, or rather somebody reluctantly gave me one and didn't administer it properly. And so it, when it came back, which was about 10 days later, it was negative. So that was the beginning of a journey that many of us have been down, which is is this COVID? Do I have COVID? Perhaps I'm just making it up. Perhaps I'm just a bit tired. And all of those fun thoughts and feelings. Um, And the kind of trajectory continued in terms of testing. When antibody testing came out, I went and got that negative. My GP told me, oh, but those antibody tests are rubbish. You have to wait and do the good one that we're offering through our clinic. So then I waited another month for that to be available. And I went and got that. And that was negative. And this was like May, June. By that point, I was already well into long COVID symptoms and being told by him, oh, no, it's just anxiety. We're all anxious, Sally. It's a pandemic which, you know, I'm a psychologist, I know what anxiety is, and this was not that. I also, I say foolishly, thinking back now, if I could have done it differently, I probably would have, but it was also very fortuitous for me. I moved house at the end of April. Uh, I had lived in a very old, what they call tenement buildings here, which are, I was on the top floor, which was floor five in British counting or six in American counting with no lift or elevator. So all the way up stairs and the difficulty that I have with stairs, even now, two years later, if I hadn't moved, I dread to think what would have happened to me. I wouldn't have even been able to go out and do anything and then collapsing days later. So I had sold my flat and bought a new one sort of before the pandemic hit or was in the throes of doing it. And finally, we got a moving date for the end of April. So acute infection, March 13. I think I moved April the 24th. And that was about the time that I started to notice fatigue that didn't really fit with my normal. And then once I got into my new apartment and being a runner, went out running, started to have the good old chest pain and that was the beginning of the joy the roller coaster that we've all been on yeah so it sounds like you actually sort of recovered from your initial infection moved house and then or did did you have a bit of a gray area in between I think it's hard I think We talk a lot about how a lot of people with long COVID do seem to recover normally and then long COVID hits them later. I think for me, the difficulty in in sort of teasing that apart is when I had acute infection, I didn't miss a single minute of work because all of my patients were so scared and needed to be seen. We were in the middle of a pandemic and as psychologists, every psychologist I know is burnt out two years later. We've worked so hard, even those who don't have long COVID. So I didn't miss a single minute of patients. I didn't tell anybody I had COVID because I didn't want them to panic. So I would, you know, be lying on my bed two minutes before, pull on a nice jumper, you know, look presentable, see them collapse back in bed afterwards. And then I also do a lot of training and we had to switch all of the training engagements that I had to Zoom, which I'd never done trainings on Zoom before, didn't really know the full functionality of sharing your slides and breakout rooms and all of those fun things. And I had a workshop that was booked for the end of March. So that would have been like less than two weeks after onset of acute infection. And I couldn't miss it because I couldn't miss the income. I, you know, self-employed person, we were all panicking and scrambling. So I definitely noticed that in that workshop, I was very fatigued and more so than I normally would have been. So for me, the fatigue was already coming in waves. It was only really... You know, when I was in the new apartment and there we were kind of May, two months later when I should have been good, but was actually getting worse. That's when I started to think what's going on here. 
And since then, have you had this kind of yo-yoing of symptoms that everybody else seems to have had where, you know, they're, they're up and down and then new ones pop up and you're like, oh, where did you come from? That's interesting. And some of them are really scary as well, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, I think I got progressively worse and worse and worse and worse to about this time last year where I was barely getting out of bed, couldn't shower, couldn't cook for myself. I live alone. So that was kind of problematic. And I think the shock of that, right, we all thought even at six months when people were starting to understand what long COVID was and I was being treated by one of the first long COVID clinics here in New York City and the doctor there said, you know, this might be a six-month thing, Sally. And I was like, what, six months? You know, we all thought that was shocking. So, yes, definitely. I think it's been the mixture of fun new symptoms, increasing fatigue, increasing disability, and disbelief and shock about that and then also connecting the dots on other things oh that's why my skin has been oh lots of people are talking about skin issues oh it's MCAS oh MCAS is related to skin like I think slowly as people were like Jess's channel and people like Tina Pierce were putting out things on YouTube and we all consumed them, even though cognitively we really struggled and the Facebook groups and seeing all the people posting on the Facebook groups. It was those, I think, oh my goodness, I'm not going crazy slowly over time, realizing, you know, the, whatever it is, 211 possible symptoms that most of us have had most of at one time or another is all interconnected Yeah, it is a massive puzzle, isn't it? I certainly, I want answers, so I I research stuff and it can be a bit of a rabbit hole and it can be quite triggering and sometimes it helps. (laughs) I think at one point I, um, a friend of mine who is a physician said to me, um, are you thinking about going to medical school, Sally? Because at this point, I think you've done more research, you know more, you're sitting down and explaining to me all these different syndromes and symptoms and systems that we didn't even cover when I was in medical school. Um, It is that you suddenly become like the world's best researcher. And yet anytime anybody asks you to explain it to them, you can't because of the amnesia and the cognitive impairment. So you're like, I know this and I know how it works, but can't tell you the words it's a thing you know there are things that sort of um you know yeah which is just really frustrating yeah I think yeah in some ways the the people that get it are the people that are also experiencing it I've definitely noticed that and the the sort of patient-led nature of it has been quite impressive as well and my doctor said to me oh we don't have any research yet and I'm like well, how come I've read a thousand papers then? You just haven't bothered to read them. But we all have. Yes, despite being brain fogged and... (laughs) Exactly, and actually not qualified to do so. But thanks. So how are things now? Are are things a bit better? Yeah, I I mean, for me, my improvement trajectory came from... um, In about March, I... I uh, saw somebody on one of the Facebook groups had mentioned a doctor here in New York who specializes in chronic fatigue and in- infectious diseases. And so I went to see her and she did a great big, very thorough investigation and lots of blood tests and found some things. And I know lots of us have spoken about potentially having had Epstein-Barr reoccurring in the body I had had glandular fever as we call it in the UK or mono as they call it in the US in uh, undergrad and I'd had six months post-viral fatigue at that point Uh, and she found that it was still in my body and doing various things and put me on antivirals for a bit I'm not sure if that was necessarily helpful but she did lots of other things including um, low-dose naltrexone which I know a lot of people are using for chronic fatigue And that for me was the beginning of something that started to do something to help me feel better. Gosh, this is also my memory test of other things that worked for me. Slowly, I feel like over time, I got to a doctor who figured out some of what was going on with my GI issues, which took a long, long time. But I started on a diet in July, which really worked for me, which 
a bit controversial. Apologies, guys. I know lots of people are on low histamine and that really, really, really works for you. Low histamine was not the diet for me. It did not help me. I really struggled with it and it didn't give me any symptom reduction. I've been doing like zero sugar keto and that for me has been a game changer, which is, I think, related to what was going on in my gut in terms of GI symptoms and um, what have you, but also allowed me to get back down to my normal weight again, which has been also great because as many of us know, we gained a lot of weight and the moment where you don't fit in your jeans anymore and you have to order new ones is just heartbreaking. I think I cried for about two weeks at that point. So I'm just about almost fitting back in them again, which for me feels yes. Um, Yeah. So the diet was a big thing. Treating what was going on in my gut was a big thing. Low dose nitrexin was a big thing. Um, And then I discovered this safe and sound protocol, which we can talk a little bit more about as we get into some of your questions. Um, But that's sort of relating to the fight or flight and and treating the the fight or flight, getting back into rest or digest. And that really, really helped me. And that was the beginning of the end for me. I think, you know, I'm not 100%, but I am working full time. And um, I'm also working with a course coach to get back to exercise. Um, That is much, much slower for all of us, but daily functioning, I can shower again, I can wash my hair, I can empty the dishwasher, Um, I don't have to choose which one of those I'm going to do each day, I can do all three, which is great. Yeah, so that for me started sort of end of March, very, very slow, then sort of late June, July, significant improvements and then September onwards has just been whoops straight up and I do still have dips I also had a bit of a relapse over Christmas which I think many 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 of us for all kinds of reasons probably similar reasons um but I made it back to the US okay I recovered from the jet lag quicker than I thought I would yeah so those are all enormously positive and comparing this time last year is just wonderful. It's like chalk and cheese, which is is so great. Oh, that's amazing. I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah, thank you. I think um, what a lot of people have struggled with is that, you know, you see support groups and you don't ever see any recovery stories there because people that have recovered have got out of there. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 hard. And I think it's it's getting that balance, right? Because those Facebook groups are really helpful. You need to know that there are other people out there. And yet, if all we're doing is reading those stories over and over, it does really bring us down. But still, we need that connection. And, and having that community is really important. I think what I'm finding now that I'm doing more speaking, because I am feeling better, is that I'm seeing even more the extent of that community. And that I feel it back and that really helps with my recovery too, which is wonderful. So, you know, what you're doing here, even though everything is virtual and feels like we're just, you know, speaking into a box, it is community and you're providing that for people. And that is really, really crucial. Yeah. We'll be right back. I'm interrupting myself for a second to tell you about long COVID breathing. The fabulous Vicky Jones and I have teamed up to bring you long COVID breathing. We are both passionate about sharing our expertise and experience of the breath and how incredibly helpful that can be with long COVID. We've worked together to develop a course that is specifically tailored to those with long COVID. It's a six week course with 12 sessions, all delivered online. The community feel and learning that we're all sharing is such a joy. To find out more information and to sign up for our courses, workshops and other shorter sessions, please check out the link below longcovidbreathing.com or email longcovidbreathing at gmail.com to start your breathing journey with us. Definitely. So, you know, mentally a long illness is just so hard to deal with, isn't it? I mean, I've I've basically never been ill in my life other than the odd cold, really. Did some of your sort of knowledge help you at all? Or did you feel like you were just starting over the same way as, as everybody else? I mean, I would say not really. And I think partly also because we all very naively didn't think it would be this long. And I think in a way that's also slightly protective, you know, because if we really truly had faced up to the reality of it being two plus years back at pre six months, none of us would have had the strength to keep going. 
And, you know, whether you call it denial or whatever you call it, you know, it is a, a functional protective mechanism that helps us keep going just one day at a time or just one hour at a time or just one minute at a time, you know. So I didn't really have any like fantastical additional resources to draw from more than anyone else because of being a psychologist. I think one thing looking back, though, and I did have a lovely moment after I started using the safe and sound protocol when my brain fog was much better when I was starting to be able to do much more work and then looking back and realizing how bad it was and you know those sort of my goodness how how was I even still working a little bit and how way worse than I thought you know and I think when we're in the worst of it most of us do to some extent think we're doing okay and then you know you open up a document of something you've written and you're like this is total gobbledygook I can't even believe you know how did somebody let me continue seeing patients but I I personally thinking back and and I think many of us with long COVID have had other things in our life that we've dealt with it may not have been another chronic illness but it might have been other difficult things and I have always had a very strong persistence to keep going with things And I think really and truly that's what got me through, but also realizing that, that not everybody has that persistence and remembering just how awful it was. And therefore why it is so important to be speaking up and to be talking about this stuff and to be talking about, you know, our psychological survival within this illness, because it's not easy. And I didn't find it easy. And many, many, many people are struggling and it's important to to be talking about it and offering support and, and also letting others outside of the long COVID community know just how bad it is, because they also need to be mindful of taking care of their loved ones and knowing what they're going through psychologically. Yeah, definitely. That's very, very true. Yeah. So I've got a big one for you here. So (laughs) The idea of acceptance, I mean, people talk about this all the time and it's something that I've struggled with throughout and I'm sure I'm not alone in this. I mean, I think it was once I realised that I wasn't accepting that I was ill forever. It was sort of where I am now, but it's still turning out to be a lot harder than I think maybe anyone realises until they're actually trying to go through it. Yeah, it's, I think... A few things. I mean, the concept of acceptance is, it is confusing. And it is also misutilized sometimes that, yeah, we're not saying you need to accept that this is your life now, and it won't ever be different. And you need to give up all of your hopes and dreams, and just be where you are right now. That's not what we're saying. We are saying you need still need to have you know thinking about hope for recovery you're still allowed to have dreams you're still allowed to dream big all of those things um and I think I really struggled actually listening there are a lot of chronic illness podcasts that are kind of about you know the silver lining to the cloud and you know getting some horrific diagnosis and within a couple of months going great this is a wonderful opportunity for me to totally change my life and be this different person and I was like oh hell no that's not me I'm not doing that so it it's there's a lot of competing narratives and stories that are told around chronic illness that also kind of muddies that acceptance word I think the best way to think about it is getting through the here and now, being in the here and now. So for me, those days where I couldn't really get out of bed, I couldn't really shower, I couldn't really make food. If I made it to the end of the day and there was some food in my plate or I'd eaten something, that was a huge victory. And you don't need to think about the next hour or tomorrow. And having moments where you can just be where you are and be like, look at that, I made it through those two hours. I don't feel as bad as I did two hours ago. You know, that to me is acceptance. And when I was the worst, the UK was in lockdown three. And so a lot of my friends back home and my family were in that same monotony of of lockdown. And so actually there are some parallels there of how do you get through those days? And it's just focusing on the day that you're in or the hour that you're in, um, that concept the other thing I really want to stress, and this is also why I want to talk so much about long COVID now that I'm feeling better, 
and being a psychologist is going back to this idea of fight or flight versus rest and digest. And I know a lot has been spoken about that, you know, within long COVID discussions. In the psychology world, we have this thing called polyvagal theory, which actually extends that idea to include additional, and it's not just an either or. Um, Often when people talk about sympathetic and parasympathetic, which is fight or flight versus rest or digest, the idea that they're both sort of supposed to be in equilibrium and you're sort of a bit of this and a bit of that and it's sort of equal, but that's not the case at all. That actually it's more sort of a system and at the bottom you've got immobilization, which is what many of us experience when we have that horrible chronic fatigue the heaviness, the brain fog, the inability to do things, the inability to think. And that usually comes from having been stuck in fight or flight for a long time. But it's not fight or flight. Fight or flight is panic and anxious and I need to do something important, emergency crisis. But our bodies are not meant to be in that state permanently. It's a very functional state in the short term, in little bursts, it allows us to do wonderful things. But when you've been in that state for such a long time, which many of us with long COVID are beginning to characterize this as, you then get the body so overwhelmed with things like cortisol and adrenaline that it just goes into total shutdown and that's where you get the immobilization. And the difficulty with concepts like acceptance or gratitude or self-compassion is that our brains cannot access those if we're in fight or flight or if we're in immobilization because that's not what those states are for. Rest and digest is that lovely state where you're connected with people and you have gratitude and acceptance and all of those wonderful things. But even in fight or flight, there's no gratitude, there's no acceptance. It's like, you know, panic, crisis, focused. And when you get anything below that, there's no space. Those things cannot be accessed either. And I spent a lot of time not really understanding this, until I started investigating more around that September time, around polyvagal theory, around this intervention that I came across that helps us move back to rest and digest more flexibly. And because it wasn't my area of specialty previously, but I'd spent many, many, many months, you know, why can't I do acceptance? Why can't I do gratitude? Why can't I do self-compassion? Knowing that these things are important. And that was the light bulb moment oh, it's not because there's something wrong with me. It's because I can't access them. I'm not in a state to access them. And I think that's, if there's one message that I can get across from this podcast, it would be that. Yes, acceptance is wonderful. Yes, self-compassion is wonderful. Yes, gratitude is wonderful. But you won't be able to utilize those things if you're in fight or flight or if you're in immobilization. And so if that's where you are, don't beat yourself up. The focus then needs to be, what can I do to get back up that ladder in order to be back in rest and digest? And those things will naturally come. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually. The idea of the third state as well and the rest and digest fight or flight. When I realized about that, that was a bit of a a light bulb moment for me as well. I was like, oh, right now I know what I need to do but the idea that actually there's another level of it as well it just it makes everything so much more kind of clear it doesn't take you think oh right yeah that explains that yeah if we're thinking about trauma which is where this polyvagal theory stuff comes from if you have any type of trauma and I know that we've also especially those of us in the first wave long COVID is characterized as a trauma But many of us may also have had pre-existing other things in our life that were traumatic, whether that be one big thing or cumulative small things over a long period of time. You're much more susceptible to going into immobilization much more quickly. And some of the strategies that are much talked about for helping us out of fight or flight, like meditation, like yoga, some of the things that you can find on YouTube. Again, if you have a history of trauma, that isn't going to be helpful. And 
you know, lots of people are having great benefits from meditation. Wonderful. Lots of people are not managing to meditate in the way that they could previously or trying to and not getting the benefits of it. And that what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Again, that's not the right tool for you right now. And I think it's wonderful that we're talking about fight or flight. And the additional piece that we need to keep talking about is what are the right tools for each individual person to be moving up those ladder levels? Because it's not one size fits all. And it's not just doing some of those things that you can find on YouTube, like putting your fingers in your ear in a certain way or moving your head backwards or forwards in a certain way. Some people are going to find that great, but some people it's not going to be helpful and may even bring you to more panic and more anxiety, which then will overwhelm you and throw you back down into immobilization again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the next thing I was going to talk about was trauma. So you've led us on very, very well to that. They mesh kind of together. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, like you say, a lot of people from the first wave, because of that feeling of abandonment and not knowing what it was, but also, you know, many other people since then that might just have had a difficult initial infection or even for some other reason, not related to COVID at all. I mean, I've, I've heard people talk about describing it as a form of sort of PTSD kind of thing. And then, like you say, that sticks us straight back into the fight, flight, immobilization response. So do you have any other sort of tips? You know, say, say meditation isn't working for somebody. Is there anything else they could look into around that? I mean, the intervention that worked for me was the Safe and Sound Protocol, which is specifically designed by the guy who has done most of the research around polyvagal theory to be a really powerful intervention to help people. It's not that you permanently get back into rest and digest because none of us is permanently in rest and digest, but it's having more flexibility with those rungs of the ladder and being able to move more seamlessly between them without getting stuck. So that is something that I would definitely highly recommend if folks are able to. There are certainly practitioners that provide it in the UK. It's an intervention you have to get from a licensed practitioner. I do offer it and I am also able to work with people internationally. But that's not the only thing. I think I would say what is incredibly helpful is just knowing what your different rungs of the ladder look like and being able to plot out for you, you know, what the bodily sensations are at the different stages, because it won't look the same for everybody. Um, So being able to do that with someone is incredibly helpful. And then looking at, I know that some people are using things like alpha stim or tense machines. Also, I've researched them less, but my understanding is it's a very similar mechanism for helping people to, again, kind of get more flexibly back up to rest and digest. There are interventions that you can do that are less, um, you know, reliant on special equipment or machinery. And again, it's about figuring out what works for you. So, you know, looking at those YouTube things, absolutely. Do a Google search for, you know, vagus nerve interventions. There are great things on YouTube that are free. There are lots of practitioners all over the world that are offering different things at different price points. You know, like a, I saw something the other day that was a workshop that I think was around $50 for a couple of hours. And that had some interventions in it. So lots of different things, but ultimately it's about figuring out which of those tools works for you. And if you try some, whatever it is, and it doesn't work for you, then just, it's not that there's something wrong with me. It's just that my body and my body's nervous system, that's just not working for it. And it may be that it's not powerful enough, or it may be because of existing trauma history, or those things, you know, we're all individuals, even though we're collectively going through this and having very similar experiences, we also have that individuality piece. And that's okay, having that reminder. Yeah, definitely. Like you say, we all kind of have to find our own way through it in our own way, even though we're all trying to achieve the same thing. Yeah, I've certainly found that breathing has been really helpful for me for that. Yeah. And I personally had a bit of an arduous journey with breathing. I was sent to that stasis program when I was first connected with a long COVID clinic and didn't make a lot of improvement. I think probably for all the reasons that all of us need breath work and then stopped and then tried it again 
a little while later and then also stopped. And that's not, I don't think it's because it's not working. I think it's also because, I don't know if you've had this experience too, Jackie, but there's only so many things that I can do in a day. And, you know, if I spent 30 minutes doing breathing and 30 minutes doing meditation and 30 minutes doing my listening exercises, then where's the rest of the day? You know, I'm also doing 20 minutes on the treadmill every three days. And then I also have to work. And then I also have to, you know, shower and do my laundry. And so I think I get to the point where there's sort of, there's a 30 minute window at about five or six o'clock when I'm done with work that I can do something, but I can't do three things. So which one am I going to prioritize? And breathing, I definitely do want to come back to because I, I think I am missing it. But right now I'm doing both a listening intervention and some stuff for my gut around that sort of gut hypnosis thing. And even that feels like I'm trying to put two things in one 30 minute window, which doesn't really work. It should just be one thing. So also that's okay, right? We can only do one thing at once. We're okay with our pacing. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I can put links to that safe and sound that you were talking about into the show notes, if that's useful. Oh yeah, that would be super. So if people want to look more into that because that sounds like it's quite a good thing yeah and I've I've been saying people are also welcome to just shoot me an email if they have questions because I know how hard it is to get questions answers and get hold of people so um we can put that in there too we'll be right back hey there I'm just jumping in for a second to see if you're enjoying this episode if you're finding it useful maybe you would consider sharing it somewhere a friend a group or even on your twitter feed if everyone was able to share just once we'd be able to get this information out to even more people who really really need it so please consider sharing somewhere if you possibly can i hope you enjoy the episode and thank you so much sure thank you that's great um so, um, yeah, I mean, this sort of relapsing up and down nature of long COVID that we obviously all know about, it can be so demoralising. How can we try to work through that and sort of keep that belief that we will get better, even when it all seems so hopeless? Yeah, it's it's a tough one. And I think it's one that I struggle with, too. You know, it's not... Again, just by virtue of being a psychologist, I don't get a a free pass on that one, sadly. Um, But I think the thing that I would stress from being a psychologist is that, you know, when we're in those moments and we're feeling hopeless or, you know, despair, sadness, disappointment, frustration, the really crucial thing is to feel those feelings first. And even though it's painful and even though as humans we are pre-programmed to to want to not feel feelings and to just get through them as fast as we can, that if we try in that moment to insert something else and don't stop and feel the full force of those feelings, we're invalidating ourselves, which inevitably is going to cost us, um, or we're just pushing the feelings down, which is going to also cost us in terms of symptoms or, you know, other psychological pain. Um, So in those moments, trying to be present with the feeling and there's a couple of things that I do but there's lots of other things that you know can be done one thing that I really like is that journaling strategy Um, and I know a lot of folks have been talking about Nicole Sachs and her chronic pain work and how there are parallels with that with long COVID and and she has this thing called journal speak which is basically you sit and write for sort of 20 minutes to just get out the feeling and that is incredibly useful and certainly something that I have done again not every single day because there's only so many 20 minutes in the day journaling I'm breathing I'm doing my listening I'm you know there's no day left because all I've done is just back to back treatment but in those acute days when I really needed it I sit down and I write it out on my laptop and that just gets it all out. Um, Another strategy, which is really, really helpful, stolen from DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, is observe and describe. And what that means is that you just pay attention to your body, observing what is happening in your body, both physiologically and emotionally, and you describe and give name to all of those things. So I am feeling tension in my shoulders. I am feeling pains in my stomach, I'm feeling tightness in my chest, 
you know, whatever it is, and I'm feeling despair, I'm feeling sadness, I'm feeling hopelessness, giving a name to those things. And feelings can really, at their most intense, only last about 40 minutes. So if you can sit with that and make it through that, then it has to start to dissipate. And then you'll find in the next hour or the next day, you can look back and say, oh, okay, yep, there's a little bit more hope now. And just remembering that process that when you're in the midst of it, it's awful and it's overwhelming and we won't be able to hold on to the hope in those moments. And that's okay. You just have to feel what you're feeling and wait to ride it out like wave. And then you'll calm down to the point and be back on the beach again and get a little bit of a moment of stillness and probably get picked up by the wave and taken back out again. But it's noticing those moments. And that again is kind of that concept of acceptance. That's I think what we're going for is, you know, here I am at the top of the wave and it's excruciating. Here I am on the beach and it's okay for a moment. Here I am on the top of the wave and it's excruciating. That's kind of what we mean by acceptance. It doesn't mean we're thinking that that's going to happen forever. It's just that that's where we are right now. Yeah, that idea of I feel terrible right now and that is okay. It's not very nice to feel, but... No, and I'm thinking in my mind as I'm talking to you, my most recent relapse of Christmas and remembering, you know, the screaming and the shouting, probably in my mind, not out loud, because I was with family and that wouldn't have been appropriate. And we do, we go through it. And yet here I am now. And I'm doing great. And it's just keeping that memory. Remembering the times that you felt good before, they will come back again. And that persistence. And that kind of leads me on to the next thing. I mean, this idea of positivity. And, you know, we can't think ourselves better. We can't wish ourselves better. Yeah. But, I mean, there is evidence that, you know, positive mindset does aid recovery, isn't there? Yeah, and I think this is a tricky one because, I, you know, if I had a pound or a dollar for every well-meaning person who's not a psychologist who said to me, oh, you just need to think positive. And I probably told them where to go, either in my head or if I was really bold by text message. So I think we have to be cautious about the use of that word. Also, I want to be cautious about not bringing CBT into this too much because I know that CBT gets a bad rap in the chronic illness world, and I certainly am not pushing that agenda, even though in my professional life, I am a CBT therapist and, you know, it is evidence based for for the disorder that I work with. But I think it's that the myth, you know, of the turn that frown upside down. We don't want to be turning anybody's frown upside down. This is not an exercise in fake it till you make it. Um, This is an exercise in noticing where your mindset is and asking, does that work for you? And if not, can I slightly adjust it in a direction that's going to? By semantics, I guess that means positive, right? Because it has to go in that direction. But it may be so incremental that you don't even notice it. I think, again, it's also being mindful that if we're in fight or flight or we're in immobilization, anything to do with mindset is going to be very, very difficult. And one of the ways that I've managed difficult moments, and this doesn't work when I'm not in my apartment, but thankfully I have been in my apartment 95% of the time for the last two years, is putting lovely stickies, um, and I even have some right here, on my mirror or on the bottom of my computer. And they say things like, what does this feel like now? And that's what positive mindset means in those dark moments, because when you're in immobilization, you can't do all of those things. You can only do what does this feel like now? It feels awful. I hate it. I don't want this anymore. Please make it stop. Please make it stop. It's not what I, you know, okay, let's go back. What does it feel like now? So I think those are the little adjustments that we want to make. What does it feel like to be feeling this? is a great way of doing positive mindset when you're in immobilization. And that can include screaming expletives. You know, there's going to be anger. There was a lot of anger for me for a very long time, and I'm sure you can relate to that, and I'm sure everybody listening can relate to that. And sometimes that anger came out directed at doctor's receptionists whenever I had to go to uh, appointments, which is interesting having worked in 
psychiatric hospitals and seen that professionally from the other way around for many years. Again, suddenly I had empathy for my patients. Oh my goodness, this is why they're screaming at the receptionist because they're stuck in immobilization and they've been gaslit and they're furious. So that's how I conceptualize it now that I do have the ability to access gratitude and think about these things. And even if, if you don't, this is me giving you permission. You don't have to be positive. You can get there, but this is how you do it in a slightly different way. It certainly won't look like what people on the outside world are telling you that it should look like. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that idea of being in your immobilization and actually you're not able to access those things. I mean, is that where the idea of you do things when you're ready to do them come from? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And that's, you know, when I'm talking to people about psychological strategies for surviving this, you know, they go in an order because they have to go in an order. The first ones are literally survival because that's all you can do in immobilization or fight or flight. And then when you do finally get back to some moments of rest or digest, then you can do some of these higher level things because you have access to that. But we have to be thoughtful about that. You know, if people are going around prescribing gratitude, then it's it's just not going to be helpful. I mean, gratitude, this is a phrase that I use quite commonly, which obviously was an allusion to anger as opposed to actual gratitude. But yeah, it won't work if you're not in the right place. And if it's not working, then that's okay. It just means that you're not in the right place. Yeah, and that's okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this idea of self-care is a word that makes a lot of people go sort of, Um, I mean, certainly until recently, I think I'd have gone whatever uh, to anyone that mentioned it. But something that I've learned on this journey is how important it is to look after ourselves and the idea of saying no to things, putting ourselves first, really looking after all aspects of ourselves, you know, our minds as well as our bodies, um, has been a bit of an eye opener for me because I've looked back on how I was living before I got ill and I can now see it wasn't very healthy. I thought it was fine, but it wasn't. Have you got any sort of tips for getting better at looking after ourselves and prioritising us? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's been all about boundaries. And I think, we know, we're talking about that more now and what that means and how to communicate it. And but it's something, you know, we can all learn to do much more of. It's funny how self-care, people were talking about self-care through the pandemic. And of course, what they meant by self-care is all the things that none of us with long COVID can do, right? Go take a walk, have a nice warm bath. None of those things were accessible to us, unfortunately. I don't know about you, but I still cannot take a nice warm bath, even though I love baths. And I still cannot walk very far. Um, But thinking about boundaries of self-care is the way I characterize it. And obviously, there was a point when I was so unwell It was impossible not to decline invitations because I physically couldn't do anything. And I think the great thing about that, even though it was awful, is that then when you're coming from that place of zero, you can be much more careful about what you put back and how you put it back. And I was very thoughtful over the Christmas period. I was in London for a month and lots of people, friends, very sweetly, family wanted to spend time with me, which was lovely. And having to be incredibly mindful of how that happened and letting people know up front you know yes I can do this on Thursday I can put it in the diary for Thursday but if we come to Wednesday and I don't have the energy I'm going to have to cancel on you and you need to know that you can't be mad at me I mean you of course you can be mad at me but you cannot write me an abusive text message about it because that's how long COVID works and just being clear with that stuff up front so you know There's no last minute. I can't do last minute things because I have to plan my energy envelope and I've already allocated it for today. If you come to me and say, can we get dinner? The answer is always going to be no, because I need to allocate that on a day when I haven't used up my energy window. So just being really upfront with people. And, you know, it for me, it's taken an adjustment, I think, 
even though I've lived in America a long time now, my Britishness is still in there. And, you know, culturally, we're much more used to just not saying what we need and just sucking it up and doing what other people want, because that's sort of a cultural phenomenon. Um, and I know that's slightly gross over generalization, but, but just being reminded, you know, since I've been in the US for 14 years and when I was first here, there's a phrase that people say, and I don't know if it's just New York, but I imagine it goes slightly wider than that. You invite them to do something and they'll say, that doesn't work for me. And that's all they say. They don't say why. They don't say anything else. They just say, that doesn't work for me. And at first I was like, God, that's rude. What do you mean? That doesn't, you haven't given me some sort of an excuse. But actually, that's really what we need to be doing. You know, I'd really love to see you. I'm really, really looking forward to it. That time you've offered doesn't work for me. And then if you can come back with the time that does and parameters that do work, then great. I think the bit that I'm noticing now as I'm working more, that I'm being stretched to do it more in my professional life, because, you know, there's psychiatrists that need a phone call and this person that needs a that and having to be, no, nope, I've done my work for today. I won't be able to call you now until next Tuesday. You know, and I've had quite a few emails back that have been, who do you think you are? You can't take four days off. And I'm like, I can do whatever I like. Thank you. And if you don't want to work with me, then that's fine. So that's how I'm trying to characterize all of this, letting people know before it got absolutely frigid here in New York, um, friends that did want to hang out with me. It was usually on a Saturday in the garden. You would come if you want to bring coffee or whatever you want to bring, snacks, whatever, that's fine. I will have my lovely rehydration fluid and I will sit there for this pre-allocated window and that will be the time that I have available to you and that's it. And trying not to feel badly about the fact that it always has to be on my terms, but it does because I don't have any other option. I physically cannot come to you I physically cannot get in a, sit in a coffee shop because I'll get sick again and I can't drink coffee and I can't eat any of the food that's in there and they'll get mad at me. So sorry, it's my back garden or nothing. So that's how I'm trying to do it. And that's how I'm trying to hold on to it as I go forward, paying attention to what works for me and not overextending. Yeah. And this idea of your health comes first. It's a bit alien to a lot of us, I think, but it's really important. Yeah. And I think so many of us, right, are sort of type A, push on through people who are just used to go, go, go. And there is no more go, right? It has to be stop, stop, stop. Unfortunately, we've all had a very hard stop thrown in our faces. And if we want any chance of getting back to that life that we love, it has to happen very slowly on our terms. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for your time and expertise today, Sally. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and I'm sure everybody listening will have learned loads of useful tips, um, as have I. So I wish you all the best with your continued recovery and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jackie. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much to all of my guests and to you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it or at least found it useful. The Long Covid podcast is entirely self-produced and self-funded. I'm doing all of this myself. If you're able to, please go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash longcovidpod to help me cover the costs of hosting the podcast. Please look out for the next episode of the Long Covid podcast. It's available on all the usual podcast hosting things. And do get in touch 